Hi, everyone. As we're all getting discourse now, I can't talk. My name is Charmaine Forgy, and I'll be the moderator for uh, our session today. Uh, so thanks so much for attending. Um, you'll see on the screen that there's some connecting with us. And so if you please take the opportunity to the meeting sign in and the reason for the meeting sign in um, is that that will provide us the opportunity to reach out to you and provide you all the information in regards to the circulation um, in regards to 1869 Maple Grove Road uh, for the plan of subdivision. That's what we're here to talk about this afternoon. Also, you'll see the comment sheet. The comment sheet is, um, as you'll see on the side there, uh, that's where you can uh, write your comments. Um, you can either do it live at the time, or you can also, of course, contact the file lead. So this is just like a regular open house, but it will be a virtual open house. Um, we do have the links to the forms that are in the chat. Um, I am going to pass it over to my colleague, uh, Andy Rizai, before we get started, um, to talk about a kind of our how it will work for our, our Zoom event. And so over to Andy, and then I'll do the introductions um, and we'll go through the agenda. Great. Hello everybody. Uh, I won't be on camera, but I will uh, walk you through how our participation protocol is on Zoom for these public uh, moderated Q&A sessions. Um, and actually, if everyone could try it out now, that would be great. What I want you to do is, uh, you know, virtually raise your hand. So you're gonna press on the participants button at either the top or bottom of your screen, depending on where it is. You're gonna, at the bottom, there are two buttons, either mute me or raise hand. And if you hit the raise hand button, and you can try it out now, it'll, it'll show to me, perfect, that I see some people trying it out, that you have a question. Now, uh, you can also hit that same button to lower your hand, but if you don't do it right now, I will lower your hand. Um, what this does for us, it, it puts you in order of uh, where you are in the uh, um, roll call for asking questions. Now, um, we won't be answering questions till the moderated Q&A portion, but when we get there, use this function and we'll make sure you can get to ask your question. One thing of warning though, if you lower your hand, once it was already raised, you will be reset. So you'll go back and raise your hand again, you'll go back to the bottom of the list. So I ask that you leave your hand up uh, you won't be able to see it, uh, but uh, we here will be able to see that your paper, hand is raised and we'll make sure that we get to your question. So with that, I'll pass it back to Sharma. And one thing, thank you, Andy. Another thing is that uh, we will unmute your microphone when it's your turn to speak. And so you are all muted right now. Um, and that just helps from um, organizing the room and also organizing who speak so we're not speaking over each other. Uh, so that's when you, when you raise your hand and it's your turn to have your question, we will certainly unmute you. Uh, so that's just another piece that's a little bit different uh, when we do uh, a Zoom meeting. And so thank you for your patience. I'm hoping technology will serve us well today. One thing I know Andy was mentioning about raise your hand. If you can't find that, you can't raise your hand. I do have people that are watching the room and they will be able to say, uh, that someone has a question. So the old fashioned raise your hand will work just as well. So I hope that uh, is kind of our Zoom protocol uh, per se, and I'm gonna go through the agenda with you, and then we'll have some opening remarks uh, from the counselor. So introduction we have with us uh, today, and sorry, I keep wanting to say this evening, not used to doing these at four o'clock. Um, myself, I'm uh, Charmaine Forgy, the Manager of Business Technical and Support uh, Services with Planning, Infrastructure, and Economic Development with the City of Ottawa. In the room with me, I have some city staff that are helping with the technology of the Zoom meeting. Uh, Andy Reside, who just uh, spoke about the protocol. Also, the city staff that we have is we have Stream, and he's the planner or the file lead, and they're Stream waving a hand right now. So thank you, Stream. Um, also, we have, uh, of course, our counselor, Councillor uh, Gower is with us and he will give us uh, some opening remarks and also some of his staff are present as well. So uh, thank you for coming. Um, also for the applicant, we have the planning consultant. We have Jamie, who's here. Uh, just raise, it, raise your hand. Thank you, Jamie. We have Emily is here as well, raising her hand. Thank you. And Carmen, you're here as well. There's Carmen. Nice to see you again. And he's here as well. So I'm hoping that uh, we'll, we'll get started very quickly. Um, and I think it, everyone's been admitted to the, to the room now. 
Um, and so I'm just going to pass it over in a moment to uh, Councillor Gower, who's going to do some opening remarks. Then we're going to talk about the planning process. Uh, we'll talk about the development process uh, proposal. And then we're going to have some questions and comments. So just as we do at any open house, there is the opportunity for a question and comments. But this isn't your last opportunity. As I mentioned, there is comment sheets. And also, um, Stream would always welcome uh, email. Um, of any comments or questions that you have later after the meeting, and then we'll have some closing remarks. So uh, with that, um, and if anyone, if your preferred language is French, then uh, we can certainly have, I have bilingual staff in the room, they'd be happy to uh, provide you your language of choice, and also the material, if uh, you preferred it in French, let me know, I'd be happy to share that in French as well. So without uh, further ado, uh, we will go to over to stream, is he going to, uh, oh, Councillor Gower now. Okay, sorry. Over to you, Councillor. And Councillor, you. Thank you, Charmaine. Merci, and thank you to Charmaine and Andy for organizing today's uh, today's information session here. And thanks to everyone who's participating, either our presenters today or any residents who've joined us. Uh, this is a very new thing for all of us. This, although we've done a lot of webinars with my team, and we've even done some online workshops. Uh, this is the first virtual public meeting that we've hosted and we're all learning as we go here and there's some pros and cons in some ways it makes it easier more accessible for, for people to participate in a video format and uh, in some ways some ways we lose a bit a little bit of that uh, that live you know we usually do these at the the Cardell Rec Center in one of the rooms there and sometimes it's really nice to bring people together in the same room so we're learning as we go and I hope that this is a useful session um, in regards to this development at, at 1869 Maple Grove Road, um, it's a part of the community I know very well. I, I walk my dog along that stretch most nights and I was biking by it this morning. Um, it's in Fairwinds and, and Fairwinds is, we'll hear about this later, it's part of an area known as Canada West. Now we think of it as Spitzville, but um, it, it's this large area south of the Queensway, um, kind of between the Queensway and Hazeldean Road. And although there's so many homes, so many people who live out here already, we're really just at the beginning of the development for this whole area. And uh, uh, I think I moved to this neighborhood 10 years ago and, and I've seen it grown around me. There's still a lot of growth to happen. Homes, businesses, schools, parks, um, you know, entertainment, employment. And uh, this is a relatively small development here, a townhome development in 1869 Maple Grove. But I think, you know, anytime we're looking at, at new development new buildings in the neighborhood it's really important that we understand as neighbors and as residents what's planned and um, and it's a good opportunity here through this public meeting and through this whole comment process to get your feedback um, I, I hope that today we're able to answer some of your questions I hope that we're able to provide information and I hope that we're able to hear concerns that you have so that we, we can make sure through this development process that we're addressing those concerns and that we end up with a development that's the best development possible for the community. And uh, I wanna thank um, Stream Shen, who's gonna be speaking next. He is the city planner on this and plays a really important role. And uh, I always look forward to working with Stream. He's, what, what Stream is so good at is translating some of the planning language into English, uh, trying to make it clear um, why, why certain decisions are made or, or you know, what zoning or what setbacks actually means. But I want to encourage everyone, if you have questions today, to please put your hand up so you can ask those. And hopefully we can, uh, we can answer anything that comes up today. And with that, um, I don't know if I'm handing it back to Charmaine and Andy or, or directly to stream for the next part of the presentation. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you so much. Um, so the next is we're going to go to the planning process. Um, I'm going to flip the slide there and this is the pa the public meeting i'll just give everyone a a second on a stream do you want to uh do you want to read the screen uh sure i will just because i i think i saw somebody on the the phone dial oh, yes so i'll just read it quickly uh this is a statutory public meeting for a plan of subdivision within the city of ottawa as required to be held under section 51 20 b of the planning act if you wish to be notified of the decision of the City of Ottawa in respect to the proposed plan of subdivision, you must make a written request to Stream Shen, myself, at the City of Ottawa Planning, Infrastructure and Economic Development Department, located at 110 Laurier Avenue West, Ottawa, Ontario, K1P1J1. 
This is a statutory um, blurb that we always put out, but you can always sign up for notification by emailing myself or using the link that was provided. Okay, so next page. So I'm here today to talk about the planning process. Uh, my name is Jim Shen and I'm the city planner on the file. So every time you have a question and you're typing in an email, I'm on the other end of the keyboard trying to reply to, to your question. So sorry if I don't always reply in the fastest time, but I do try to get back to everyone if you have a question. So I encourage you to email me. Next slide. The site is located at the north of Maple Grove Road within the city's Stittsville community. It has frontages also on Bensinger Way and Myconis Crescent. The surrounding land, as Councillor Gower has mentioned, was developed back to the Madame Fairwinds North subdivision around 2012. You can see this parcel itself wasn't included in the big plan of subdivision, and we typically call this a holdout parcel. What happens is when large developers such as Madame come in and try to develop communities, they will generally reach out to these smaller landowners to try to buy their land whenever they're adjacent or nearby to the subdivision development. But sometimes a, uh, a price couldn't be agreed on or the landowner wanted to live in the area and doesn't want to move. So then these blocks are left out of the big plan of subdivision. Eventually, one day when the landowner chooses to sell this piece of land, generally what happens is a different developer, like this case, comes in, purchase this land, and come in with a development proposal to complete the community. Next slide, please. So next, we'll just talk about the city's official plan. Uh, a little bit of background. In Ontario, planning is what we call a policy-driven process. So it starts off at the pro provincial level. The province sets out the provincial policy statement, which is a list of statements that talk about what the province is interested in. And then the city take those statements and incorporate it into our official plan. The official plan basically brings those statements down to a more localized level. The city of Ottawa official plan provides a vision for the future growth of the city and a policy framework to guide the city's physical development. Within the city's official plan, there's a big map that designate all the area within the city's urban and rural area into individual designation. So, this designation will tell us whether the land is for employment use or is it a main street or whether in this case it's designated as a general urban area. What a general urban area means is an area that permits a full range of housing choices, such as single, single homes, semi-homes, townhomes, and generally the building height will be four stories or lower. Next slide. This area also gone through a separate um, planning process called the Kanata West Concept Plan. So this process is what the councillor mentioned before. It's a step below the official plan process. And then look at this area specifically. It was done back in 2002, and it pretty much just aligns with what the official plan designation is. This area is designated as a residential area A and permits those residential developments. Since the circulation, there's one thing I'd like to address. I've received a lot of comments about trying to keep this area as a green space and to limit development. But I would just like to clarify that the city does not have the right to limit private sites if it meets all of the applicable policies. However, what we can comment on is how the proposal functions um, and how it's compatible with the adjacent development. So those are all comments we welcome and things we look to get addressed through the planning process itself. Next slide. So what is a plan of subdivision process? This is the planning app process we're here to talk about today. So in Ontario, for you to be able to sell part of your land to somebody else, you have to go to one of several process, and one of them is plan of subdivision. What it does is it divides a parcel, a large parcel, into individual lots and blocks for development in an orderly fashion. For larger subdivisions, this division will include things like street networks, um, parks, or uh, commercial blocks. But in this case, because it's a holdout parcel in an established neighborhood, it only seeks to divide the big parcel into three blocks. The subdivision process itself is a two-step process. 
First, we have the draft approval, which establishes the general layout of the subdivision. And then we have registration, the completion of the detailed design process. These two stages coincide with the ability to sell and close on homes. So once a developer receives draft approval, this is when they can market their home and sell it to individual homeowners. But it's only at a stage of registration that they can transfer the ownership of the land from the developer to the future homeowner. So things that get reviewed through the draft approval process itself includes things like road capacity, uh, stormwater management, sanitary and water capacity, the size of the lot, Does, is it similar to the adjacent homes, the compatibility with adjacent uses. And following that review, a list of hundreds of conditions are developed to facilitate the completion of all the requirements. And these conditions talk about the detailed engineering design and the landscape plan, the financial requirements, and all the legal agreement. So it's only at a stage of where all of the conditions are cleared can a developer register the land and transfer the ownership over. Next slide, please. So with that, I'm passing the presentation over to Jamie Posen and Emily Coyle from Full Tank Consultants to talk a little bit about the development proposal itself. Great, thank you very much, Stream. And uh, Charmaine, hope you don't mind, I'll just jump right in here. Um, just want to say thank you, I guess, to you, Charmaine, and, and to Andy for uh, helping to facilitate the session. And thank you also to Councillor Gower and to uh, Veronique. Um, both uh, the councillor and his assistant were very uh, instrumental in um, helping to organize and prepare for uh, this meeting. So it's uh, much appreciated. Um, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Jamie Posen. I'm here with my colleague, Emily Coyle, and we're both here from Foten Consultants. We're a planning and urban design consulting firm here in Ottawa, and we were engaged by uh, Carmine, who's here on the call, uh, to help uh, navigate the process, and in particular, the approvals process, which includes the draft plan of subdivision uh, that we're here to discuss today, as well as the zoning bylaw amendment that's associated. So our role here is to go into maybe a little bit more detail. Um, there will be a bit of overlap from what Stream was uh, mentioning a moment ago, um, but uh, we can uh, help to bring things down to uh, a level of detail um, that I think will help everyone to understand what's proposed. Yeah, thank you. So that's us uh, there on the screen. And of course, both Emily and I are on the call. Um, and just to note that uh, the letters after my name refer to my membership with the Canadian Institute of Planners and also the fact that I am a registered professional planner with the Ontario Professional Planners Institute. Go to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, so we, um, I'm sure most on the call are probably very familiar with the context. I suspect that most on the call probably live in the immediate area, but the image on the screen, and I'll, I'll be as descriptive as I can um, in light of the fact that uh, some are dialing in today. Um, it, I was just a side comment. It is really remarkable that we're able to do this kind of meeting. Um, normally, of course, this would be done um, in person as a statutory requirement, but uh, it's, you know, a real testament to the age that we live in. Um, that we're able to, to do this, whether through video or, or through uh, telephone, which is great. Um, so the image on the screen here um, is uh, just showing the overall context. And Councillor Gower was mentioning that uh, the development from Fairwinds North is really kind of just the, the beginning of um, a larger um, vision of development in this area that includes some of the areas to the west um, and, and to the north. And you can see um, in this context view of uh, how this property plays into what uh, will likely become a larger uh, development that the, the plan calls for in the future. So we're showing uh, Fairwinds Shopping Centre to the southeast, uh, Palladium Auto Park and Canadian Tire Centre to the north and the uh, Tanger Outlets uh, to the north as well. And of course, Highway 417, uh, which is a major um, expressway uh, through this area for access to places beyond, including um, central places in Ottawa and, and beyond that. Uh, we'll go next slide, please. So Stream mentioned this. This is uh, what was is known as Schedule B, uh, otherwise known as the Urban Policy Plan from the City of Ottawa Official Plan. Uh, I won't go into too much detail because it has been mentioned already, but of course the yellow color signifies general urban area that Stream was mentioning. And uh, that's a very, uh, very common um, designation that's applied to residential areas of this kind. 
Um, you can see the proximity to other colors in terms of uh, some of the land uses I was just mentioning uh, to the north and east. And uh, so it's, you know, the site is obviously very well situated in proximity to other um, community uses. Uh, next slide, please. And sorry, I'll just mention, and, and this comment will apply to this slide as well, uh, basically that a full range of uh, housing types are permitted in that general urban area, uh, including the townhouses and semi-detached uh, units that are proposed as part of this development. Um, and the yellow color on this map from the Canada West concept plan illustrates a very similar um, type of designation allowing for that range of housing. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's a, a zoning map. Um, and maybe I'll build on what Stream was saying before about um, holdout parcels and what ends up happening with these uh, lots that are actually not incorporated into larger subdivisions like the Fairwinds North. Um, in this case, what ends up happening is uh, lands that are from a policy standpoint envisioned for future development are assigned a zoning uh, call, what we call uh, development reserve or DR. So the map on the screen here is showing the zoning for this site as being a DR uh, zoned. And what the, the intention there is really to uh, restrict land uses in the short term with the understanding that it will be subject to a rezoning application in the long term um, that will uh, integrate into the surrounding community. And so what we're experiencing uh, through this process today is really the beginning of that overall process of the development that was always envisioned for this site. Um, and so the DR zoning is only temporary. And as we'll see in a moment, uh, the, um, the intention through an associated process is to uh, submit, it already has been submitted a rezoning application that will go alongside of the draft plan of subdivision that is the, the primary subject of the call today. Um, when the site is rezoned, I, I think we have a slide. Uh, actually, I think it's the next slide. We'll go to the next slide, please, Andy. That's right, yeah. So this is just a little bit of detail about the zoning bylaw amendment. As I say, this is not the primary purpose of the meeting today, but just to give a little bit of uh, context here. The application has been submitted to rezone this site to residential third density uh, with some exceptions. Now this is entirely consistent with the surrounding lands. So the surrounding um, townhouses and back-to-back -back townhouses and uh, all the residential uses in the immediate vicinity have virtually identical zoning to what's being proposed for this site. Um, it remains to be seen just yet because we're still refining um, through the process, but if there's an exception, um, those four X's there in brackets uh, indicate um, uh, if there needs to be any particular details that uh, uh, need to be incorporated into the amendment to permit what's being proposed. So we are available to answer any questions about the zoning if, it, if they come up, but uh, as I say, the primary purpose is um, for the plan of subdivision. And with that, I believe uh, on the next slide, I'll turn it over to Emily and she can go through the uh, plan of subdivision, the draft plan of subdivision, some of those details and the details of the proposed development. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Emily. So this slide here is showing the draft plan of subdivision, which is the reason we are having this meeting today. Now, normally they're not this colorful, but uh, we've delineated the blocks to make it a little clearer through the presentation and through this format. So the application for the draft plan of subdivision is looking to create five blocks. Now blocks four and five are more procedural blocks in the sense that block four is for a potential future road widening and will be conveyed to the city as well as block five is for a corner site triangle. So that's to make sure that there are no obstructions coming around the corner on uh, Bensinger or Mykonos. Blocks one, two, and three will be the location of the dwelling units. So blocks one and three will be the location of the townhouse blocks. And block two, so fronting on to uh, Mykonos, will be the location of the semi-detached units. Um, next slide. 
So this here is the site plan, so you get a better illustration and understanding of what is proposed through the development. So you can see block one, two, and three. Um, a total of 18 units are being proposed. So this has the two units in the semi-detached, as well as 16 uh, townhouse units with parking facing onto Ben Singer Way and Maple Grove Road. Uh, on this plan, you can also see that the dwellings were designed with a similar built form to uh, other built form in the area. Specifically on this one, you can see the existing townhouses fronting onto Grenadine Street are quite similar in form to what is being proposed here today. Next slide. So these are some conceptual renderings and elevations of uh, what will be on the site. Now, what I do want to point out is that the site plan that you have just seen uh, will remain largely the same, uh, but the elevations may change architecturally. Specifically, these ones here um, are uh, different than the site plan in the sense that the site plan we've made some changes based on conversations with the city planner very recently um, where a few units have now been mirrored so that the driveways are paired allowing for more opportunity uh, for street parking. There will also be as part of the landscape plan trees are planned to be planted along the streetscape so in the front yards of these units which aren't shown right now on these elevations. But architecturally, um, the details will differ, but they were designed in a way that does feel similar to the existing character of the area. Uh, that is some back-to-back -to -back townhouses as well as some regular townhouses. These here are just regular, so they will have um, the backyards. Uh, next slide, please. This here is just another um, elevation of the site. It's not as detailed as the renderings, but you can see what the front of the units will look like as well as the rear of the units. These have been provided with the application package, so if you did want a closer look, you could go on the city's website and uh, see those for yourself if you wanted to, you know, zoom in on anything. Um, I think that might be it for us. Next slide. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Emily and JB. Just uh, go over what happens next in the subdivision process. So the city will continue to gather public comments. Uh, we always accept comments up until approval, but uh, the preference is if you can submit them early so we can incorporate it into our comments to provide it back to the developer so all the issues can be resolved together. But we always accept comments and like to keep the conversation going. The draft plan and conditions of approval are then finalized and I will write a staff report and the decision will be made by my manager with concurrence from the ward counselor. Once the decision is made, a notice of decision will be sent to everybody who made a comment. Next slide. So with that, we'll get into the question and answer period. Um, and I'll turn it over to Charmaine to help moderate. Thank you, Stream, and thank you for the presentation, Jamie and Emily. So now we're going to go into our question and answer period. Um, and so as we mentioned before, um, if you have a question, please please raise your hand with uh, using the participant uh, button and raise your hand. If you're on the telephone, um, apparently, I've never used it, so I'm star nine raises your hand if you have a question. Um, but I'm going to check in with the person on the telephone if I don't hear from them. Um, if they have a question at the end, but apparently for the folks on the telephone, star nine puts up your hand. So I uh, haven't done that before, but uh, I'm hoping that works. If not, I will certainly check in with you. So um, any questions in regards to for uh, stream or for Jamie and Emily? Okay, I see that Kate has a, a question. Uh, Kate? Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Kate, thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, just for, if we could, I don't know if it's possible to refer back to the slide. I believe it was the, sli the slide that Emily spoke to, the site plan. Okay. 
Um, in that, I'll wait slide. until it comes up. Yeah, slide 19. Yeah, slide 20. Yeah, slide 20. Um, for the houses that are on Grenadine Street and back onto this property, in the slide, there's two what look like black or gray boxes. I'm wondering what those are. Okay, so uh, Emily, the, the black or gray boxes, what are those? Yeah, so um, I don't know if Jamie also wants to chime in as well. Um, the black or gray boxes are for storm water. So currently they are um, planned to be like cisterns. Um, currently they're not a sure thing. We are waiting for confirmation from city staff about it. Uh, so they would be holding any kind of storm water. Um, they would be more like permeable pavement. I don't know if Jamie has anything you'd like to ask. Yeah, no, that, that's a great summary and thanks for the question, Kate. Uh, yeah, that's effectively it. Um, they will be, if they are required, and again, that's still an open question right now, um, but they will be effectively, um, you know, more or less at grade and, and lower underground. Um, so it's meant to, to hold the storm water from this site um, one of the consequences of uh, this being a holdup parcel that's being developed at a later stage is effectively that uh, all the stormwater management that happens on those townhouse units that you've referenced along Grenadine, they're kind of self-contained with regards to stormwater, and this site will be more or less self-contained with regards to stormwater. So this is to help facilitate that. And it's often um, you know, designed by civil engineers who specialize in this area um, for a um, rational and effective way of um, containing and distributing stormwater to and from the site. And just quickly Can to I add to it, there's no, uh, no connection made to Grenadine Street. If it's approved, the connection, it goes right down to Maple Grove. So it doesn't impact any of the existing homes. It's just an underground storage tank and with an outlet to Maple Grove Road. And Stream, could you maybe just mention a little bit about the process from the city's perspective, the process that goes into that, uh, the approval piece for that? Sure, of course. So city have um, professional engineers on staff. And uh, what the engineer does is they take a look at, they want to make sure all the waters are controlled on site. So they're not allowed to drain into your neighboring property. And typically with a big subdivision, what happens is the developer will build a big pond to accommodate that water. And then the water will fill the pond and it will outlet slowly into a creek or a channel, a natural water course. And through that, all the you know, infiltration as well as to get rid of all the grits and all the dirt. So in this case, because it's such a small site, they're looking at different ways to deal with that water. And that's why they're proposing this. Right now, this is with our um, professional engineer for his review. He also does a circulation to the city operation to people who look at the overall master planning of the infrastructure. So it's being looked at from all angles and make sure that it's not affecting any existing residents or causing a problem to city capacity. Thank you, Stream. Uh, Kate, did that answer your question? Yes, I think it did. I, I, there's one little part I'd like to clarify. I think Jamie had mentioned that they're mostly on ground level. So I just want to confirm that they're not big bulky things that would kind of be blocking the view from the backyard of the Grenadine Street homes. Okay, Jamie? Um, yes, it's a great question and uh, that, yeah, that would be my understanding. I also saw Carmine uh, raising his hand there. He might have a comment about it, um, but basically because stormwater sinks to the ground, it, it's something that occurs uh, below grade, yes. Okay, thank you. Carmen, do you have a, do you have a comment? Yeah, just to make a comment, I, I've been through these developments before, so they, you won't see anything. All the storage is done underground. The city of Ottawa does a pretty good job at foreseeing 100-year flood events. So what happens is they, in order to account for those major events, extra storage is needed on the stormwater, and that's what those tanks are for. They're fully underground, so you won't see any of them. Uh, you'll actually just see grass. You won't even see that they're located there. So... Uh, they're technically non-existent. It's just underground work that's being done. Thank you, Carmen. Okay. Um, so next question is to Mara. 
Hands, you're, un you're unmuted. Mara? Can you hear me? Yep, we can yeah. hear you. Oh, perfect. Uh, I just had a question, um, and it, it just goes not just for this site, but I know uh, Fairwind's community is growing. Um, what is being done uh, from a community perspective to increase traffic flow as we are increasing in density? Thank you. So for traffic flow, who would, who would be best? Uh, position? I can take this one. Thank you. So one of the biggest, um, the problem with the Fairwind community has to do with the Hummar and Maple Grove intersection. Uh, it's about to reach capacity and there's a lot of traffic delays associated with it. So although the lights were put in, it wasn't, it's not the final configuration. So upgrade still needs to happen. This site in itself was very small. So when they did the transportation screening form, it didn't actually trigger a transportation impact analysis. But I'm also working on the files, for example, the clearage and the formation at the Western end of it, as well as the Urbandale subdivision, which will host the public meeting as well in the coming weeks. So these larger subdivisions that, that contributes a lot of traffic to this area, we are asking them to do a sensitivity analysis. One of the reasons um, you haven't seen this file progress is because of that intersection capacity issue. So we're trying to figure out when will that intersection reach its capacity limit, and we're either going to upgrade the system ourselves. I've been talking to our transportation staff um, with the, uh, the city about this issue day in and day out. So we'll either do the upgrade as a city ourselves, or we'll ask the developer to front end it. And what do I mean by front end is they will go ahead and build that infrastructure into place to be paid back by the city later because this is a city project. That's why. Uh, we need to, to pay them back. And the money comes out of development charges. So every time a house gets built, um, they pay a fee, what we call the development charges fee. So that fee is supposed to account for changes to, for example, the road network that needs to be upgraded in terms of capacity to make sure um, all the existing traffic flow problems can be resolved. Uh, so that's mainly what's happening on that front right now. Thank you stream over to Councillor Gower. You have a, a comment? Uh, yes, thank you, Charmaine. Just to add to that, Mara, um, you know, traffic is a, a big concern in Fairwinds as it is in a lot of parts of Spitzville. And I think as residents in this neighborhood would know, um, Huntmar Drive right now is functioning as a, the main north-south arterial, the main north-south route through the community. It's not really supposed to be doing that in the long term. One of the big projects, transportation projects that we're working on in Spitzville is to complete construction of the Robert Grant Avenue. Robert Grant right now just goes from Fernbank to Abbott, but the plan is to extend that road all the way up to essentially Palladium Drive and the Queensway. And that's gonna take so much pressure off of, uh, off of Huntmar Drive. The other thing I wanted to add too, is if you go to my website, at uh, glengower.ca, today we just published a, a little update. The city's moving ahead with uh, environmental assessment, which is essentially a, a study on two north-south transportation corridors that are are adjacent to Fairwinds. One of them is Huntmar Drive, north of Maple Grove, and the other is Stittsville Main Street, north of Jackson Trails. So it's looking at how do we properly design those two transportation corridors for, for vehicles, for bicycles, for pedestrians, even for buses, um, in order to make sure that we're, we're addressing the transportation needs to get in and out of the community. And then the other thing I wanna to mention too is a little bit longer term as well, um, there is still a plan to bring stage three of light rail all the way out to Stittsville. And uh, under that plan, there would be a transit station just east of Huntmar and Maple Grove. So that's another way that we can give people an, an alternative to driving a vehicle, and that'll help alleviate the traffic concerns here as well. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Mara, did that answer your question? That answered it perfectly. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question is Stuart. And Stuart, you're ready to go. Hello? Yes? Um, I was just wondering, we're like right on the edge uh, where the retaining wall is. And I was just wondering, is the retaining wall gonna stay there um, along with the chain link fence and the trees, the large trees that are on the property? So who's best to answer that? It's about the retaining wall and the large trees that are, are I guess, along that that piece and the chain link fence. Uh, Stream, did you want to answer that or should I? 
Uh, I, I could chime in a little, but I think uh, Carmine would be the best person to answer it. Um, so right now we're looking at the uh, tree conservation report. Uh, so in, from a city's perspective, we always try to retain as many trees as possible, except in some cases it's not, it's not always a possibility. In, in this one, um, it's a little bit tough because what's gonna happen is all of these homes are going to be sold to individual homeowners. So when we have a tree located in somebody's um, future homeowner's backyard, then that tree is no longer a city, it's, it's not a city tree, so we don't really have any control over this. So what we tend to do is join the detailed design process. When I was mentioning there's a two-stage process, we try to put as many street trees on the cities right away as possible to make sure that tree canopy really grows and matures in the future. Um, in terms of the chain link and retaining wall, generally, um, the rule of thumb is we should not be impacting any existing homes, but I'll let Carmine speak to it to see if he, he knows a little bit more. So uh, typically when you buy a new home, I know you guys are probably used to it, uh, the fencing, the developer doesn't typically fence in the property and he leaves it to the neighbors to figure it out amongst themselves, typically if you buy from a big builder. In this case, we're not doing that. Given the size and scale of the property and where it's situated, we're actually putting up the fencing. So all the houses will have a fenced in backyard. Uh, as far as the retaining wall, it should not be impacted. Um, uh, and the chain link fence, which chain link fence are you referring to? I just want to get a clear idea of where your property is or where, which uh, is it off? Yeah. Uh, where the block of houses right on Maple Grove to the left okay. of the property. Is it where those two tanks are? The underwater storage, the, the stormwater? Uh, no, we're facing Maple Grove. So on the opposite side of that. You're on the opposite side of Maple Grove? No, we're on the opposite side of the water tanks. Carmen, we're just, we're gonna, bring on the, we're just gonna bring this up for you, Carmen. Maybe Perfect, that helps, that helps. I was looking at it on my screen at the same time. <laughs> the bottom left. Here. Is that, is that yeah. what you're referring to? Yeah. So there's the retaining wall that goes front to back and it has a chain link fence. Yeah. So most likely I, if I, if I do choose to remove the chain link fence, we'll replace it with another fence. So uh, ultimately the fence that's existing here will either be kept or replaced with something better. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. No problem. Thank you, Carmen. Did, does that no answer problem. your question? Did that answer your question? Yep, thank you. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, there's the baby. <laughs> Next question is for Rob. Go ahead, Rob. Hi. Hi. Oh, you can't hear me. Okay. So really just a couple comments and sort of a question. Uh, one, from my point of view, and others might have different, I, I welcome you. Uh, it's going to be an improvement and, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, one observation I'd make was something that's happened to us and, and other people I know. And, and so I guess this might be directed to you, Stream, um, and maybe you too, Carmen, is so the townhouses are going to be eight long. The one I'm in is six long. And I'm not blaming the city or the, or the, or the developer, but uh, I'm an end unit and uh, five of them have access through mine instead of access, you know, like four in, in your case, Carmen, or, or uh, three in, in my case. So I have to let it, and, and that's fine. I, I, I under, I'm yeah, an end unit. I understand people have got it, but it sure surprised me when um, everybody goes through me instead of dividing it in two. I hope you guys have looked at that and it, it kind of is irrelevant to me, but I, if anything, I'm trying to uh, think of the people who do end up buying a place and one guy at one end is not going to be too happy if seven of them are going across him. Um, uh, the other thing I would mention and we kind of already touched on it, is, is the road. And Stream, I would, I would suggest that we have reached capacity. 
There's sometimes if I'm coming from Hazelby, it takes me 20 minutes to turn left onto Maple Grove and I really don't have another choice unless I go down Rose Hill and down Santa Lina and then loop back into my place. Uh, I've had it happen a couple times, not real recently, but I've had it couple, happen a couple times where I'm coming down there and one block past the turnaround or the, the circle, traffic's backed up because there's so many people turning left and that's their only choice. There's so many people turning left that all the cars are backed up. I end up going down, loop down through Rose Hill, come down Maple Grove, and I get through before the other people do. Now, that's not all the time, but it's, it's, it's um, and it's not an unknown thing. It's, it's, it's just a huge thing. And while your development here is quite small compared to the one just down the road from you, and the other one that's going to be down at Hunt or in Maple Grove, I, yeah, something's, gotta be, something's gotta happen here. Um, rather than, because these things seem to take years and years and years, whereas the developments go up pretty quickly. Um, it, it's, it, it's, uh, it's gotten worse and worse and worse over the years. And at least, uh, at least now we don't get all the traffic coming down John Woods, but uh, there's still some there. So anyhow, that's, that's, again, it's not really a question for you to answer, it's a comment. Okay, thank you. So there was two pieces there. First, I'll get Carmen. Uh, yeah, so we actually had this conversation with our engineers the other day, and it's typical that you see a lot of townhome developments do have easements that go across each other's backyard. And, and, and I, as a developer, I saw it as a problem. I wouldn't be comfortable with someone going through my backyard. But the reality of it is it, it has to do a lot with infrastructure. I think the, the purpose of that easement is to create a, uh, an infrastructure easement throughout the backyard because that's where the like the stormwater drains run through. So if there is any issue that happens with those pipes, the city needs to go in and being the city needs to go in and be able to repair them on behalf of first the the community or the area or the or the project, or if repairs need to be made to pipes that go along. Usually, the the reason they put them along the back of the property line is usually. If you go to the back of your site, you'll see a sewer typically um, where the water drains in for stormwater. And the reason they put them back there is it's because it's the least intrusive. So in case anything happens in the future where they need to make repairs, they create that easement to create access to, to those pipes. Um, as far as your other comment, uh, I mean, I, I, we're doing other projects in the area, so we do understand your traffic concern. Uh, with regards, and I hope it improves because as us as developers want to see improvements in traffic and infrastructure in the areas that we build in the future. Uh, but as far as this project is concerned, I think the traffic impact is so minimal uh, that with the 18 townhomes and when each one leaves, I think you'll see the most impact in the morning, but it's, the number of units is small enough where I don't really think you'll see a big impact when it comes to traffic. Thank you, Carmen. Um, Stream, do you have any comments to either of those? Sure. Uh, Rob, I just want to say we, we definitely hear you and we hear these comments quite frequently. I know Councillor is, uh, is one thing that, that's on his priority list. I know we're closing in on finishing the design and every second day I just hounce our engineer and say, can we, can we move this project up to make sure you know, we don't have any problems in the future and to get this intersection upgraded? We're definitely very, very aware of the issue and we're trying to resolve it as soon as possible. Good, thank you, Stream. Rob, did that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, the only one thing I would say though, uh, with regards to the first one, Carmen, is I wasn't so much concerned with the right of way. Uh, I've been an interior townhouse in a previous one and, and I, I fully understand you have to get into your backyard. You know, the, the point I was trying to make was since it's eight long, and you guys will do what you do, but it would be really nice if it was four, for, you know, four from one end and four from the other end. Because as I say, with eight, you'll end up with well, the other end would be one and you. So you end up with six people going across one end if you do it only from one end. And having had that here, um, I guess I'm speaking to the people who buy the house. It, the poor person is the other end. If if it's if everybody goes across him, that's too bad. If, whereas if you divide the thing up, anyhow, you you will do what you do on that. And 
I just wanted to make the point. Okay, thank you, Rob. And I appreciate it. Oh, oh we muted. Sorry, sorry, Rob. We muted you too quick. You have another comment? No, no. I just, I, I, I just want to say thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. So I'm just going, I'm going over to Dana right now. Dana, you're unmuted. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So my concern is, I, I understand um, people are talking about the congestion at Huntmar and uh, Maple Grove. And yeah, it sucks when you have to wait, but my concern is I'm scared to let my kids out in the front yard because of how fast people get going by the time they hit Maple Grove and Johnswood. I'm just wondering why it's 50, if it could possibly be 40, like every other residential street. And also, the, where people come down Maple Grove to Santa Elena to Rose Hill, now that Johnswood is closed, it almost seems like people think it's just one street. Barely anyone ever stops at the stop sign, and when you're coming the other way, if you're walking, a lot of people don't look, and they just zoom on to Santalina, and it's just a concern. Thank you, Dana. Uh, Councillor Gower, do you have a comment? I, I do, and I want to thank Dana for highlighting that. Uh, Dana, some good news. Maple Grove is being re-signed as a 40-kilometer-an-hour street um, any week now, basically. It was something that uh, I got council to approve earlier this year, so... It's a long time coming, but it will be re-signed as 40 kilometers an hour. We are also implementing over the coming months um, some additional traffic on Maple Grove, because it's one thing to just change the signage, but you also have to actually change the physical layout of the street. And as we have new developments coming in, we're also looking for ways, uh, you know, this, this is small and doesn't have a, a vehicle entrance onto Maple Grove, so it's a little bit different, but there's some other developments that are, are proposed for Maple Grove Road, and every time there's a new development, it's an opportunity to reconfigure and improve the layout of the street. Um, some residents who are on the call might have also noticed some of the temporary traffic coming we've done on on John Woods near Rose Hill to try to slow down the vehicles and provide a, a safer spot for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, the one thing uh, uh, that I did want to mention though is if you ha have any concerns, if you see unsafe driving or people blowing through stop signs, please report it at ottawapolice.ca. The police do use that information to focus traffic enforcement. And right now during COVID-19, they actually have a special program. It's called Operation Overwatch. And they are out there every day handing out tickets. Uh, unfortunately, with fewer cars on the road, people are using that as an opportunity to speed or ignore the rules of the road. So they are doing more enforcement. So please report these things to ottawapolice.ca. Okay, we'll do. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor. Uh, Dana, does that, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to hear that it's going down to 40. That really makes me feel a lot better. People yeah. might only go 70 now instead of like 80. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Oh. Oh. Okay, thank it's you. It's probably still too quick at 40. You know, a lot of the new subdivisions, the lar larger subdivisions that we're starting to approve are now being designed to keep traffic speeds down to 30 kilometers an hour. So um, that's really what we need to get to eventually in all our communities. Okay. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, before I go to uh, some other call, I'm just going to, to make sure I haven't uh, not included the uh, person on the phone. Uh, the person on the phone, uh, you're now unmuted. Do you have any questions? No, I'm good. I'm just uh, listening to everybody. <laughs> I am. Uh, it when you're talking about the chain link, you're not talking about the chain link going um, the retaining wall uh, from Grenadine onto that property, are you, Carmen? You muted yourself. You have to not play with your mute. There you go. Yeah. Um, no, nothing will be impacted on Grenadine Road. If there's an existing retaining wall, there's nothing in the plans to replace a retaining wall. So that will remain. Okay, perfect. Thank you. That's okay. all I've got. No, no okay. fault. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. And thank you. I just wanted to check in with you. Thank you. Um, okay. So just, we have a few more questions for uh, uh, folks. I'll go to Kate uh, has another question. Kate, you're uh, ready to go. Thank you. Um, a similar question to what the person on the phone just had. Um, the, the, there's a small retaining wall on the backyards behind Grenadine Street, and behind that there's the chain link fence and then some very mature trees. And so I know previously um, somebody had asked a question about trees on the other side of the property, but I'm wondering about these ones that are um, behind the backyards on Maple Grove. Um, will those, can any of those be uh, salvaged? Like they're there's a lot of like quite a bit of wildlife living in there and it's just a nice 
view to have from these houses and they're very mature trees are all healthy it would just be a shame to see them go so i'm wondering for some input on that okay thank you um and uh kate i'll just hand it over to carmen i put it back up on the on the screen to just help with maybe the visual mm -hmm. carmen, do you have a comment so we uh, as far as the retaining wall I, again i don't i don't foresee any issues or, or any plans to remove that retaining wall or adjust it um if there is a chain link fence it may be replaced with uh, a, a better quality fence or just to meet the standards of our construction but again there will there will be a fence there it will be removed uh as far as the trees are concerned we work with a, a great landscape architect firm i understand the sensitivity of the trees especially on this property there are there are a few there are quite a few trees on the site and, and we did work with our, our landscape architect to try to salvage as much as we could. So there, I think there, after reviewing that last night, I think there is a few trees that will be salvaged and new trees that will be planted. So we'll try to mitigate anything we remove as best we can. And we'll work with the city and our landscape architect on doing the best mitigation possible for the site. So there will be some new trees planted, some will be saved, uh, and others, unfortunately, uh, we have to, removed because they're in the way of the construction but anywhere we we can we can mitigate we, we will do that thank you carmen uh stream do you just want to speak about uh the the trees and what the city does in relation to the trees sure we have a city have dedicated foresters that review all of the planning applications and actually one of the comments i haven't passed this on to the developer yet is to see if we can uh, save some of the trees um, behind the homes on Grenadine. So we'll definitely be looking out for that comment and we'll be working with uh, Carmine to try to save as many as possible. Okay, thank you, Stream. Okay, uh, Kate, is that, does that answer your question or your concern? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Kate. Um, over to uh, Stuart. You're unmuted. Hi, um, I'm sorry if I missed it at the beginning, but I was just wondering what the timeline is for our building. Okay, put it over to Carmen. Would you like to answer that? Or I guess stream sure. from the process point of view. Well, we'll go for a stream from a city's process po point of view. Where are they in the, uh, in the application process? So right now we have completed the initial circulation. Uh, we're in the process of gathering all of the city's technical comments, and from today, we'll gather some of the public comments. I'll put those in the package, and I'll provide it back to Carmine in about two weeks. And then they will take, you know, a month or two months to come up with a resubmission package to come back to us. And this can go on a couple of times until all the uh, issues are resolved. Then we reach the draft approval stage. From there on, they need to do the detailed engineering design to finalize everything before they can start the construction work. Uh, so they're definitely a few months away. And Carmen can talk about what his plan is in terms of construction timeline. Okay. Thank you, Stream. So that was from the process, from the city process of the application. And Carmen will speak about the construction. Over so, uh, yeah. So as far as the timeline, I guess, again, we're at the mercy of the city. but. Working with the city has been a pleasure. I mean, they, they do have timelines on their process and, and everything is followed pretty well. And we've worked with the city and stream and Mr. Gower, Councillor Gower on, on other projects as well. And it's been pretty streamlined. So as soon as that approval happens and as soon as we've addressed all the city's comments, we then go on to the construction phase. Uh, that typically takes, I mean, I would say it's a 12, for the project this size, no more than 12 months. As far as the disruption, and I think that's the reason you asked the question, as far, like, what are we gonna, we're gonna hear the noise and the hammers and the bulldozers and the digging phase and the infrastructure phase. The good news is it doesn't appear to be uh, any rock blasting in the site. So as far as that's concerned, it's good news because the soil content allow for us to dig without having to blast any rock, which is great. Uh, there, so, I would say it's a 12 month timeline on all 18 homes. Uh, and then probably six months before we're able to get inside the homes. So uh, we're, we're do, we try to expedite and do, be the, less, the least disruptive we can. And, and we don't take breaks when we, when we do our construction. We try to get to the finish line as quickly as possible, not to disrupt the neighbors. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, Councillor Gower, did you have a comment? 
I, I do. I just wanted to mention one thing that we are doing with any new construction, no matter where, no matter where it is in the community, is um, for this one is no exception. We will be holding a pre-construction meeting for neighbors, and we'll do that with Carmine and, and his uh, his colleagues, just so the residents have an idea of how long this will take, uh, what time in the morning this might you know construction might begin. Is there any blasting? You know, how will it affect your properties? And then we'll also have. Um, you know, direct phone numbers in case there's any issues with contractors and so on. So we'll do that for this one as well. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Stuart, did that answer your question? Yeah, I was more just curious about like how long until it started, but it sounded a couple months to a year before they could get started. But the rest of the information was also great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now, Hall, you're next with a question. You're, you can go ahead. You're unmuted. <laughs> Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Um, thanks for all the details that you share with us. Um, my uh, lot is exactly in the other side of the um, uh, project, 100 Centralina. And uh, my main concern is about uh, the green area and the trees that we have over there. I'm just wondering, um, based on uh, your description, you want to keep a few of the trees and then definitely you want to remove most of them. Uh, I'm just wondering, is there any challenge? hands to, to, uh, to the city or developer to keep them or um, I personally myself I will be happy to have them in my lot um, if they can keep it and just remove it is it possible or no because uh, that's the main <laughs> one of the main reason that I choose this uh, lot uh, because of the nice view that I have <laughs> and by now uh, in uh, less than two years Years, I will not have all those greeneries. Okay, so, thank you, Nahal. Uh, Stream, could did you want to um, speak about that? And uh, so, for on the tree transplant front, what we find is the the smaller trees tend to transplant better. Um, if Carmine is agreeable, um, I I think you guys can definitely think about working something out about transplanting some of the smaller saplings or trees onto your private property. In terms of planting them on the public right away, we really have to take a look with the city's uh, forester to see because underneath the, the ground, although the ground looks very nice and uh, smooth, there's a lot of utilities and different things underneath. So uh, if, if it's planning to be on city right away, there's a more rigorous process that's involved before we can allow the planting. But if Carmen is agreeable to it, you guys can definitely talk about planting some within your property itself. Okay. Uh, Carmen, uh, thank you, Stream. Carmen, over to you. Um, as a developer, I'm especially in, in we've done some development in Florida where they where we've actually moved some massive trees. I don't like to do it on the big trees. It's actually there's a 50 50 ch chance of survival when you move trees that size that have been established for a long time. But on the small trees, we have no issue if you want to pass on your contact information and any of the small trees that you would like to plant on your site, we'd be happy to move them and, and, and even plant them for you. So uh, I have no problem uh, if you maybe want to share your contact. I don't know if it's the right thing to do it on the phone call, but uh, find a way to get, get me your contact information and I can, uh, I can keep in touch with you. So when we do start removing some of them, we're able to, uh, to accommodate. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Carmen. I would suggest uh, perhaps for the contact information, Nahal, you uh, reach out to uh, Stream and he can, he can do the connection. If that's if that's okay with everyone, okay. Um, and and how does that does that sound good to you? Yeah, for sure. If uh, I have, if you share with me an email, uh, definitely I can uh, send you uh, my contact information. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think that and uh, were any more questions? Just giving a, sorry, I'm just looking. Uh, no, it looks like we've, uh, all the questions have been, uh, have been requested and responded to. So uh, thank you so much. I'm just going to put it over to, uh, I'm just gonna do the next slide of how you can provide uh, further input and then I'll put it over to uh, Councillor Gower for some closing remarks. So, sorry, just give me a second. Uh, thank you. So just to remind you, uh, uh, everyone on the line, um, meet and sign in form, please press up that, that's in the chat room and it's on the screen. 
at, and for the person on the phone, oh my goodness, it's a big long e email at big thing they're asking me to say, but I will. It's HTTPS colon slide slash two of them form F O R M dot J O T F O R M dot C O M slash two zero one six three four eight two o two four zero two four one and that's how you can sign in to make sure that you're getting circulated on a, how this uh, application proceeds and for the comment sheet please reach out to uh, stream for a comment or for folks that are on the call, you can press that and that's your comment sheet as well. Again, please keep yourself updated. The application can be reviewed on ottawa.ca slash devapps. And also your comments for attending the planning committee on the zoning bylaw amendment uh, application. That's another piece as well. As Stream mentioned, that all comments are taken up until when it goes to committee, but it's always best to give them early um, so Stream can take them to, into account uh, and have discussions with the developer. Uh, once again, um, I'll just hand this over to uh, Councillor Gower. Councillor? Thank you, Charmaine. Uh, first of all, thank you to Charmaine and Andy for, for moderating and hosting, um, hosting the session. I want to thank um, all the residents who tuned in. One of the hallmarks of healthy communities is when we have participation from residents um, on issues big and small. And I really appreciate your questions today. And uh, if there's anything we weren't able to answer, there's lots of ways to get in touch. And you can also contact me as well. And if you visit glengower.ca, there's some more information there. We have a few more sessions like this coming up for local development files. There's one coming up later in June for a proposed gas station at Hazeldean and Fringewood. And there's another one uh, for 130 Huntmar, which is also in the Fairwinds neighborhood. Um, thank you to Jamie and Emily and Carmine for answering the questions today and to Stream, our city planner, for being here. And I'd also like to thank uh, someone who's in the background for this call, but thank you to Veronique from my team for uh, all of your support today as well. And uh, really appreciate everybody taking part. I hope this was useful and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor. And so this ends our, our meeting for this afternoon. So once again, to echo uh, the Councillor's uh, comments, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Uh, and, you know, community and stakeholder relations is very important and to be part of your community. And so thank you for spending the time. I hope uh, it was a, a benefit to you and you got to learn some things that you didn't know before. Um, and stay safe in these challenging times. And thanks, um, thanks to everyone. Have the, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.